All right, we are here today. Welcome to this episode of Head Above Water. We have with us, we have Jack Gravina and Diliana Gravina, who are dear friends of mine. I used to work with Diliana at a company called Framework Studio, and they are independent filmmakers right now, and they do a whole bunch of other stuff. And I'm going to let them tell you about what they do. So welcome to the show, Jack and Diliana. Why don't you guys give me, give me a little bit of your origin story, what brought you out to Los Angeles, what you guys are working on now, and what it's all about. Wow, okay. All right, good thanks thing you for have, the intro. Good thing you have seven hours to record. <laughs> Jack, why don't you start? So... I came out to LA. I always knew I wanted to come out to LA and be involved in movies. You I went, always, I'm interrupting you already. Yeah, you always it. knew you wanted to oh, come yeah. out to LA because I love talking to people about coming to Los Angeles. We yes. get to it. So I originally wanted to come to Los Angeles. As soon as I graduated high school, I wanted to come to college out here. I applied to USC. I actually got into USC. USC film? Yes. Okay. But I ended up going to University of Miami. Okay. Uh, on a music scholarship. Uh, the scholarship kind of made the decision. And for it was you. Miami. And I was like, well, I'm going to go to LA afterwards anyway. Okay. So, <laughs> you know, let's enjoy Miami for four years. Ended up graduating from Miami with a degree in music, music composition and uh, composition for film and media. And then I got a kind of an internship out here with the film composer. I came out through this composer residency plan by the composer Christopher Young, who is famous for doing Nightmare on Elm Street and oh, Hellraiser wow. Great. and uh, a bunch of horror movies. Great. And you interned for him. I didn't intern for him. I got a residency where it was, he basically put up, had this whole program for young composers to come out and live super cheap for four months. And it's like with other composers. So it was like a little networking thing. Great. And through that, I got an internship with John Powell, where I com you know worked as an intern for him for a little bit. So I, I came out here originally to do music, thinking I was going to do music, but I also, you know, with a passion for film, I wanted to be a film composer and also just a director. I had always loved making movies with my friends growing up. Sure. My father worked for the company Avid when I was a kid. Okay. So that it, he was a salesman. He didn't really, he doesn't really know how to use Avid, but he, we always had a system in the right. basement. Okay. That's exciting. It was exciting. So I would, when I was a little kid, I would make movies with my friends and edit it on Avid, not realizing that's the industry standard for yeah editing software. That's great. So I came out, you know, I, when I was, you know, 14 or 15, I learned how to use that program and ended up coming out to LA originally working in music, but getting an internship for editing. And eventually I worked at discovery editing sizzle reels and the network. Element. Yeah. Discovery channel. Great. So I ended up working at discovery channel editing sizzle reels. And then a couple of the sizzle reels sold and got turned into series. And eventually I was pulled to edit on those series. And that's how I became a TV awesome. editor. Okay. Um, Great. And then somewhere along there, we met probably <laughs> actually right at the beginning. I met Diliana right when I moved I'm out saying, to like, LA. She's hearing half of this she's, for the first time I herself. Know. What? <laughs> no, but I, right. Actually, it was a month after I moved to LA. I met Diliana. Great. Wow. At a recording session, a scoring session. Yeah. Um, at the Sony lot. It was for the movie Mars Needs Moms. Mm -hmm. That was a Disney, the Disney's biggest flop of all time. The Disney, I, Disney's biggest flop of all time. Mars we were on the scoring stage together. We met and we fell in love. <laughs> <laughs> Over a Disney movie. Yeah. yeah. Both. What brought you to that, that, that exactly. stage that day? Well, so I'm originally from Bulgaria and I moved to the U.S. in high school. I also always wanted, knew that I wanted to be a part of entertainment in some way. Um, I was always a dancer, always in front of the camera, but... Didn't know exactly how, but Los Angeles was always pulling me. Okay. Um, so I went to film school in San Diego and um, ended up eventually moving to Los Angeles. Kind of, I don't know what to do. I just need to get my foot in the door and, right. and figure something out. So in school, I studied directing and producing. You know, moving here was just kind of like, all right, I'm not going to work at a restaurant anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to figure out whatever. I'm just going to keep meeting people and networking and get into something. And figure out so when you moved me. here, you didn't have a job lined up already. No, I just I moved in with a couple of friends from San Diego, and I was just in fact for the first probably year, maybe like eight months, I did the most random jobs, just like found some jobs on Craigslist. I PA'd, I did just you know random stuff um, until I got a job interview with our former boss uh, okay. right. Framework <laughs> at Studio. Framework Studio mm -hmm. and ended up getting a position as an executive assistant to, to both owners of the company mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and how long had you been in Los Angeles when that happened for you? I want to say maybe eight months. So it was pretty early in your journey mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I moved in and I was just like, oh, my God, I need to learn from people. I need to be surrounded by people who are working in the industry and being creative. And we had already met. So... Um, 
you know, that was that. So Jack, were you also, when you came out here, did you have a job lined up yet or did you come out here just fresh faced? No, I, yeah, I totally came out here fresh faced and with no job lined up other than knowing I had four months at a very low price. Like I could afford it was like four hundred dollars right, yeah, so a month. Were, all right, so in this yeah, your living Christopher quarters Young were being paid for residency by, program. By yeah. the residency. Um so I had four months to kind of figure it out. Yeah. Other than that, I just had no idea what was gonna happen. Were you here. were either of you guys worried at the time? Like tell tell me about what you remember <laughs> about were we worried your original well, your original Los Angeles experience you know, when I first came out here 20 years ago, I had an internship at an edit facility that's no longer no longer with us, <laughs> but uh, an edit facility that's just not not around anymore. And yeah, just I mean, you got to take that leap of faith sometimes. But do you guys remember your where were you guys at mentally when you came out to L.A.? Just there's the excitement of all the limitless possibilities, but also the how do I pay my rent this month? Uh huh. I mean, I think I was pretty excited. And I think that carried me through for quite a while. At least the eight months. Until I think, you're... yeah, I think I was not necessarily naive, but just kind of like pushing through that. Anything is possible. I'm finally right. in LA, you know, my dreams will come true. And how old were you Whatever guys at this time? Are. I moved here late, actually, I was 26. Okay. So I guess it wasn't quite the spring chicken that many people are. I was 22, 22. As young as Jack was, All right. I was a little yeah. old. I had some experience in San Diego. Yeah, I've almost been here ten years. I'm 32 now. Okay. Um, um, I was never wor worried really when I came out here. I I don't know. I've I've always you know I had uh, I knew knew that there was opportunities to edit. Like that was kind of always a backup plan in my mind because there's there's always money in editing. I felt like. Did you want to direct or act at all? Or you just had your your heart I set on what, music and editing. Yes, those were the well, two. Well, no, I didn't really have my heart set on editing. I don't think any. Well, some editors really love it. I love editing, but I never had my heart set. I want. I had my heart set on making movies, and I had my heart set on working on the music for them. So making movies, there wasn't anything specific about it. You just wanted to make stuff. Yeah, and this is where you can. I to always do that. felt happiest when I was putting something like finishing a project and Great. coming out with something whether it's a song or whether it's a, a movie or whether it's something that just takes people for a ride you know like i don't care what it is awesome let's go back to when you were interviewing with framework then so he had an idea of what he was wanting to you you learned the directing and the producing in school but is that what you wanted to immediately get into because that's not what you were doing at framework at least initially Right. Just tell me about that, you know, that experience of getting that first big job in Los Angeles. Sure. I think when I when I moved here, I was definitely at a crossroads between, OK, do I want to pursue in front of the camera, dance, acting, or do I want to really focus on producing, directing? Um, and I quickly just kind of thinking about it, thought, all right, I just need to make money. So to me, producing seemed like the best most concrete way to figure out how to make money okay People, you know i need how to did, learn what, what yeah what made you feel that way for me it was just like i need to learn how to make things i need to know how to do everything behind the scenes and i need to be the person that everybody needs to come to so that they can get their projects off the ground right so i feel like just the logistics side of producing i mean it's logistics and creative but something about producing gave me that feeling of all right i just need to figure out how to do this and I can make a career out of it. Great. Um, also learn as much as I can so that I know how to do, produce my own things, finance my own ideas. Um, and just, you know, I think it came from, from there also from just the practice, just the, I guess the practical side of, I need a job and I right, need to learn how to, um, I need to learn tools that people can hire me for. So when you interviewed with framework, were you, like, did you have plans if you hadn't have gotten that job? Like, were you, was that one of the first interviews where you were just going on interviews, just trying to find some work and... No, like I said, I had multiple really odd, quick jobs. Um, <laughs> I did some guerrilla marketing that was very questionable. <laughs> I don't even want to go you into don't, it. You don't have to it, expound it on that. terrible. Yeah. I did, you know, that is a good, it's, that's good. That's though. a good story, but not for, for another time. <laughs> um, what else? I did PA gigs, you know, that were just like, oh, I have oh, yeah. a I have a PA gig. In fact, we did we some together. PA. I, PA. I think I did like the Critics Choice Awards one year. And what else did we do? Some like reality oh, show. My God. We did a uh, top model. Top model. So we anyway, did, yes. so I did I did that. PA. I had no idea if the framework job when they come out to L.A. <laughs> if I 
I, I basically, if I didn't get the framework job, which I had no idea if I was going to get, um, I got introduced to George, the owner of the company, through a mutual friend that we had. And so I actually just went in to kind of pick his brain and, and say, hey, I'm, I'm new to L.A. If you have anyone you want to introduce me to, feel free to help a girl out. Right. And through that, he ended up calling me, I think, six months later and was like, hey, we, I think we might have a position that would be good for you. And sometimes that's just how it works. So you just so when you guys you said you had a friend in common like was that a friend from school? Uh, no, it was a friend from San Diego. So it was somebody. It was actually one of George's friends who I ended up meeting as That's well. Great. So we yeah. Mutual so I mean friend sometimes yeah sometimes it's as, as easy as just dumb luck gets yeah. you right in the door. So now you guys are getting your foot in the door. You're doing a little bit of the editing at Discovery at that point. It was, yeah. And you get the job at Framework, and you're starting to produce and, and do projects with them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So how long did you work for Framework? Let's ask that. I worked for Framework for about, I think, close to six years. Six years? And you were still at Discovery this entire time? Yes. I had started working in development at Discovery, and I think I just switched into series, editing on series around that point. I don't know, I don't know anymore. With the time I was twenty seven, I, I was twenty seven when I first got uh, the job editing okay. on a series, and I remember being really excited that wow, this is I'm making a show. It's going on TV. This right. is really exciting. Your name's in the credits. My name's in the, the credits. It's great. It, that show was called The Demon Files, by the way, which is kind of funny. <laughs> Look it up. Uh, yeah, it's a, it was on Destination America. Oh wow! All right. Well, I mean, hey, that's that is a that is a channel that everybody just about everybody has basic cable. So I mean, just about everybody's been able to see your stuff. Well, so, well, let me ask you. Let me ask you this question then. So, as your career is is moving on, how many years did you do that? You said. Uh, so I mean, I'm still editing. You're still you're still series. with them. I'm, oh no! So I became a free like basically as a development editor. You're under the umbrella of Discovery. You, I was a paid employee of okay. Discovery. However, when I started editing series, I went. It's basically you become a freelancer when you start editing series, and that's when things they're saying like, oh, you get a lot more money to be a series editor because, but. Now you're gonna have to find your own jobs after that. So right. it's kind of like cutting this cord. So let's so let's talk about that a little bit. So one one of the things that's very frightening about working in the entertainment industry in Los Angeles is the freelance economy, the yes. gig economy, and and it is frightening. Never really knowing sometimes where your next job is coming from. When I, before I started working at Framework, I was also a freelance editor for a very long time, and that's why I took the that's why I stayed at Framework for ten years because to me, for me, it was always more important to have stability. Mm -hmm. I came out here, I wanted to make movies, I wanted to edit movies, I wanted to do the whole thing, but I, like you said, I wanted to make money, I wanted to have a career, I wanted to, you know, get my foot in the door, certainly, but also plant my flag in Los Angeles. And it came around that I decided to stay out here because when it's November and it's 90 degrees out, there's no need to move back to New York City. Totally. So when I decided to actually stay out here, it became more important for me to have stable work. Mm -hmm. Because when you're freelancing, you, something like you said, sometimes you just don't know where that next check is coming from. Talk to me a little bit about going from a full-time employee. Now, your career is moving upwards in one respect, but in another respect, now you have all the worries of a freelancer that oh, yeah. you didn't have before, benefits and health insurance and things like that. Totally. Tell me, talk, talk to me about like the, the anxiety and the worry about that. Like, How did you come to terms with all that? Uh I, I kind of just dove in and didn't think about it, okay. honestly, as, as much as I probably should have. And that's a perfectly reasonable answer. I, so like, I was scared, It was scary. I was no like, you know, not, especially, of course it happened at the time when I turned 27. So I'm like off of any, you know, you're off of your parents' health care at 26. <laughs> I had like one year of my parent, like being on, like, I, what was it? Up until 26, right? Yeah. So I had one year of discovery paid premium health care, which was Awesome. That feels already like a career milestone. I know, You're just like, like, I have my health insurance right. paid for. And then it's like, I have to, you know, give all that up so that I can edit on shows, which, yeah, it pays a lot. It, it did pay a lot more weekly on a weekly basis. So I was like kind of weighing that thinking like, okay, if I keep getting these shows, uh, I think I could sustain this and make this work. And I could it, even, it would be worth it for me to pay for my own health care. And, um, you know, I could build something out of this and i also knew that if you edit sometimes you can get into directing which it eventually did happen sure and we'll talk about that oh. absolutely so you never really gave any any hard thought to like oh my god when this job is over i'm gonna have well, to hustle here's the thing that was really nice about this situation when i first took the job i knew i had another edit gig lined up after that because 
basically the, the demon files show was the first show that i edited but it wasn't the first show that i sold so there's another show that i had in development that it sold called true nightmares um, now when you say sold, like like that you were i didn't like sell your it own for, thing it was i edited the reel that the network looked at and they said yes let's make this okay show. great so you know i was really proud of that sizzle reel for true nightmares it looked it was awesome they did two seasons of it on the id network it's a really fun show it's really great. fun scripted show uh, not script. It was like half scripted. You know, it was like scripted reenactments. Reality. Yeah. What are they even? Yes. Yeah. What I guess you call it scripted that? reality. Scripted reality. All right. No. But it wasn't reality. I don't know. Well, it's like true script crime. We, we just we, we make up a new genre right here. It's scripted reality. Scripted That's what we'll call reality. it. <laughs> Truthful. Script. Trust me, it exists. All right. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I had that secondary show lined up. So you knew you had something to fall back on if this thing fell yeah. through at any point. Right. So I had. I at least had the next. You know seven or eight months planned out, which was nice. And then what's great about working on a series, and this is why, they, you know, this is a networking thing, but like what's great is that everybody finishes their show on the series. And if you maintain a good relationship with them, they all go on to other shows. Sure. And it became so one of those things. So you're networking while you're meeting people while right. you're doing all of this Just stuff. Just hanging out, getting mm -hmm. lunches with people, like asking, you're on a show and you're like, hey, let's get lunch with you today. Mm -hmm. Like, well, let's, let's sit down and, you know, let's go get a sandwich. Yeah, you, you just know? get on somebody's radar. And then even if you don't realize you're getting on, so I would do it without, you know, right. trying to be right. pl plot the future. It ended up paying off at, in the long run when people would be like, hey, I'm on a, a new show over in Burbank. You know, you want to jump on? It's, you know, four, it's, you know, three month, it's a three month run six episodes and it'd be like oh yeah sure let's do that and then i kind of just started bouncing back and forth and it was an organic thing luckily i never was in a position where i was like six months out of work panicked and i'm really grateful for that i'm really grateful that i've had the chance to kind of so you never really had a big any time where spell. like your rent is due that week and nothing was happening and you're like i don't know you know knock on wood it hasn't happened okay yet great it's been you know, that's, I've been that's very, definitely the goal is to pay our rent <laughs> very grateful for that to happen but i could see how it could potentially happen and sure. there's always a little bit of the fear in the back of my mind when it's like you coming to the end of a show and you don't know what's gonna happen next. sure of course of um, course so what are well, you I, doing while he's you know bouncing around from well show? i feel like at that time i think i was still at framework mm -hmm. i don't know i don't know the time how the timelines are anymore because mm -hmm. i've just forgotten right. but for me the for me the experience was a lot different going from full-time to to freelance this is what i'd love to hear about too because you look as we're talking about it it sounds like you didn't really crystallize these memories of worrying about these things because it's just, maybe sometimes you just don't want to worry about it but yeah. I'm, I'm interested yeah to tell me about your journey with that while he was freelancing and stuff i remember having extreme anxiety quitting my full-time job i knew that i had been with framework for six years i had gotten comfortable it was a little family you know i knew what was expected of me i had grown a lot i mean I liked everything about it, but a little part of me was just, just knew that I needed to spread my wings okay. and that it I, I was just starting to become a little bit jaded or stale within that environment. Anything particular that happened that you want to, that you can talk about, like that made you sour on that experience? I, I ask because again, you know, for me, I was always Mr. Full-time. I need to be a full-time guy, even though it took me away from what I thought I wanted to do at the time when I was at Framework for over 10 years. So getting back to you leaving Framework. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, when I was at Framework, and I, I I mean, there were many, many opportunities for me at you know any number of times over 10 years that like I could have left and gone done, done in something else. I was too, I was afraid to do it because I didn't want to go back into the freelance lifestyle and have to go, which is exactly where I'm at right now, mm -hmm. <laughs> chasing after jobs and stuff like that. Talk to me about your thought process and what brought you to the decision to leave a full-time job that you had for six years mm -hmm. you know like you said you had gotten jaded a little bit if there's anything in particular or you know sometimes it's just time sometimes it's just time to do something else but tell me a little bit about your thought process going from a full-time position into something that's not quite as stable well i definitely think it was just the time um for me i think that I deep down am a freelance type person. I like flexibility. I had always been like that. Uh, you know, throughout college, I had always two or three jobs and supporting myself, going to dance practice. I always had a schedule that was sort of its own world, <laughs> its own thing. 
um, that I can shape and change however I wanted to. So you had actually stepped out of your safe, so your safe space. You had stepped out of what you were expecting to go to full time work. Yes. Whereas in my situation, a little bit reversed. Like I left, you know, the uncertainty of freelance work for the stability. But you you, you did it the other way around. Yes. Framework was my first full time job ever, and I remember even the first day when when I signed my contract. I remember thinking, "Oh my god, I have to go." To the same office every day for the same hours, and now, you with know these people. With <laughs> well, I mean, it was just like the idea that now my schedule is locked in, and these are the times that I have to be somewhere every single day was a little scary in a way. Oh, okay. But of course, there was so much to learn and to experience, and right. I, I, I loved all of it, and I think it was the most one of the most significant things that I've done in my entire life. But I think once I got to a certain point, I realized that I was just itching to go out there and see what I can do on my own, almost like a little challenge. But at the same right. time, like human beings, I am a creature of habit. So it was, I had settled into a position. I I think I was also, you know, th there was a, a part of it where, you know, I had gotten a title and I had, I felt like. The, there were all these things that had built my identity as a producer. Adults have titles. I mean, um, <laughs> yeah. And so for me, it was a little scary to <clears throat> just the thought of, okay, well, when I'm done with this, I'm, I'm nothing now. Like nobody cares about what I do the next day. Like I have to go find my own jobs and network with people. I have to go out and sell myself, which I don't really consider myself being very great at. Um, it's just work. Being freelance is full-time work. Sure. Even if you don't have a job, you're hustling for that yeah. next job. So I think... Juliana doesn't like to sell herself enough. She's always very <laughs> modest, I feel like. It's a, yeah, it's a curse. It sounds like that's um, a conversation you guys have had before. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I think it's tough to sell you, yourself, and especially in L.A. when you're kind of expected to go out and just be like, this is what I do. This is what I Do you I think am. she's making it harder on herself by now? I think she does make it harder on herself. <laughs> That, but by like having this thing that's like inside of her that says don't brag don't be <laughs> be you know, be modest be modest yeah. i've had other people tell me stuff like that before when you are for you're, you're hustling it's usually actors you know that that when i speak to that, that kind of mm -hmm. feel that way because like some you know actors are modest and want to let the work speak for themselves but <laughs> you have to hustle you have to market yourself yeah. like the better the actor is the the more mo I, and i kind of think that's where it come it comes from in a sense like the better the actor or the actress is the less they have to brag about themselves like let the work it they do let the work speak, and that's what i think diliana wants to do too and <laughs> And I think that's what I that's my dream is I don't have to say anything <laughs> yeah. about myself. People just flock and want me. Um, that's how it is now. That's that's how it is now. Living so you just you just don't feel comfortable when you're talking to someone going, you know, just pimping yourself out <laughs> to a degree. I mean, but so I don't know. I guess I'm just I'm never that excited about, oh, I'm just going to go over here and just like blow these people out of the water with how cool I am. Right. You know, I think it just there's a, a limit to it, you know, but. I have to say that it was also an experience that I had to have. So leaving Framework again was absolutely terrifying. And I, to contrast what Jack was saying, I had I was very much worried. I didn't have any jobs that right away were available for me or lined up. So it was a little bit of, wow, I have to go out there and tell the world that this is who I am and this is what I do right. so that people know I'm out here and that they can hire me. And that I think took that took a little while. It honestly just to get to a place where you feel comfortable going out there and mm, letting no, people know. No, I mean I didn't I, I didn't have the luxury of waiting around to feel comfortable. It was it just took a little while for me to spend time with people, talk to people, have my network or community or whoever it is kind of realize, oh, she's freelance now. We can hire her for these shorter right. term projects or whatever it is. So at any point after you left framework, did you feel like you had made the wrong move? No. So you all, so even when you're worrying about all that stuff and hustling for the work, you're like, I still did the right thing for me, for my life to leave at this time. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. There's no, no question. Cause I about think, that. I also think that that's one of the most important things about trying to have a career in entertainment. I think a lot of people tend to get comfortable and you tend to not want to take chances cause you want to get that job and hang on to that job, you know, sometimes to the detriment of your own career goals and stuff like that. So it, it takes a lot of inner strength and confidence in your abilities and your, in just what you bring to the table to know that your time at framework is over and let's hang out our shingle and see what happens next. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that fear can fuel you into pushing you into bigger and better things. 
I think that's what it was. It was just the fear of not accomplishing all of the other things I wanted to accomplish and just because I was too busy Great. At, in a full-time job. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about then you guys working together and then we'll get to, we'll talk about some of the directing stuff, Jack, that you've oh, been yeah, doing no, lately. Yeah. Um, so during this time, you're doing your editing thing, you're working for Framework and then you leave and then you start producing other stuff. When did you decide, probably way sooner than you guys leaving your positions, but when did you guys start deciding, hey, let's team up and make this a thing and we can do our own stuff together while we work? Like, tell me about your working relationship with each other as all of this other professional stuff is happening around Sure. You. It's interesting you're talking about the fear of not doing what you want to do be doing and i think we kind of realized both of our jobs were skirting what we want to be doing right and what we really want to be doing is something that we're not doing so we need to start doing what we want to be doing right so like you're right you <laughs> if have that some makes sense no absolutely so you have some stability you're we paying the rent you're paying exactly. the bills but you're finding that you want something more you want to be doing yeah. things you're you you do not want to be doing stuff for other people all the time or you, you know i'm getting comfortable at editing reality tv shows i'm getting good at it but at the same time what i want to be making movies and i want to be you know writing scores for features or being a part of the scoring sure. process for fe big features and I think editing reality has a lot of helpful to like you sharpen your tools, you get good at it and editing and but you're not making those things. So I think that's why we decided to come together. Diliana is like a master mind of production and knowing everybody and knowing how to kind of, OK, this is what we want to do this is how we're this is the creative that we want to accomplish. This is what we are going to need to do to make it happen. Where, you know, me as an editor and a composer, I'm post all post. Right. So between the two of us, we realized, oh. Together, we just perfectly mesh on a production company side. Great. And now we can <laughs> start doing things. And, you know, we, it started with us just picking up a camera and shooting at a cabin in Big Bear. And right. <laughs> About when did you guys start deciding, let's start making our own stuff and that way we can do the things that we like to do and we can do it together? Um, I don't know. I want to say like three years ago or something. Four years ago. So I, fairly, fairly recently. I don't know. We yeah. just like we had all like he said, we'd been doing our own projects and working on our own careers. And then we realized, all right, let's shoot something. Let's come up with an idea and just do it and see what it takes. And I think, you know, there's always ways to come up with excuses. But it was kind of like, what resources do we have that we can utilize right now for free or low cost? Oh, yeah. And we've always been lucky, like our, our neighbor who lived below us, he doesn't live there now. This guy named Will Myers had- Jason knows Will, I Oh, think. you know Will? Do I know Will? He's an editor, uh, DP editor Will. He worked oh, on a couple know, of Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. he came into Framework a yeah. couple times. Yeah, yeah. I remember Yeah, that so he great. had a, you know, a red camera and he was like, oh, we should shoot something. And we just, we used all the opportunities we had of people saying like, I have a nice thing, let's, let's use it. Like you, you were saying earlier, there's like a potential location that we can shoot. <laughs> right. It's like, yeah, we be careful because we may hit you up for that. Right, absolutely. Um, we just, we just, but I think we, uh, we just figured out how to use the resources around us mm -hmm. and just actually utilize them. If somebody offered, hey, I have a, a red camera. Do you want to like shoot something sometime? In two days, we had a script and we were like, all right, well, are you free next weekend? Let's do it. And you guys were just writing, writing this stuff yourselves. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And then was this your first experience writing stuff too? Or like you're just like doing a, giving yourselves a crash course and <laughs> no and filmmaking. Well, we, uh, We've been. I've been writing stuff since. Okay, I was so a kid. you had been writing yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. You, well, you were like, writing. I've never written anything, but let's give it a shot. My, my mother's a writer. My okay. aunt's a writer. I've always like kind of been in the the world of writing. Of Great. writing. Yeah. Uh, my cousin actually lives out here. He's making his own movies, and you know he, his whole family is are writers. But anyway, I just, I love I love writing, but it was one of those things where okay, what can we do that we can actually pull off? Right for. <laughs> these little to no money we have to do it. So where were you getting the money to do these things? Well, for the first few, we didn't barely spend any money. It would be like, you know, $300 for a light. Okay, so you're not like going deep into like not your savings or anything. Yet. No, I mean, our first film, our DP was our neighbor with his own camera and we shot in our apartment. Yeah, we built a, a rig out of 
PVC pipe for a shot that, you know, like they, they call it snorri rig, where it's a camera that attaches to your body and faces you. So when you're running, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, you're running course. down mm-hmm. the street, it's, you know, the Requiem for a Dream shot. Sure. Or the, uh, they've, they've used it a bunch, but we, we built like our own rig for that out of PVC pipe. I think it costs like $13 or something. <laughs> That's how you do it. You know? I, I acted in it. Jack directed Frugal it. Filming. Um, yeah. We had a couple of friends that we sort of pulled into our, you yeah. know, we were just like, it's going to be really fun. Just, just come over and you guys can just grab some, order some food right. and you can hold the light and <laughs> you can be over here, you know, keeping track of the schedule on the shot list. And we just did it with a crew of five and out of the five, two kept rotating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go take a nap. No, yeah, I'll come was, back. Somebody else is coming. <laughs> the nice thing about living in LA is like all your friends are in it in, you know, in that world too. Like we have other friends who are directors and composers and, you know, just our group and they're ready to just jump in and producers sure. who are just eager for that kind of stuff. And, and we, we realized that we had those connections and friends and people around us. And that was another reason why we thought like, okay, we can do this. And then Deliana started producing commercials and other promos through our company as well. And that ended up funding like some of those productions and ended up funding more of our passion projects where we did actually pump some money into sure. it. So that's, that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you guys mm-hmm. about. So you guys are starting to make your own stuff and you're self-financing. Yes. Like it's all, you're not Kickstartering. Nope. You're not doing any, have you guys done any crowdfunding yet for anything that you worked yet. on? So it's, it's, so, well, I, no, this I is just a touchy <laughs> subject too. It's not that touchy. I just it's I a, think crowdfunding is great for people who want to do that. This may be tapping into my inability to feel comfortable to sell myself, mm-hmm. but I cringe at the thought of having to ask people for money and it's clearly a problem that I have. Well, I don't have a problem asking people for money if there is a financial gain for them to have in sure. the future. And I think that that's a difference with crowdfunding versus like well, that's, yeah, getting investors, investors versus but like having a real business plan. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. We should probably end up figuring out crowdfund. the crowdfunding situation. Too, I mean, because- the, the landscape is really changing very rapidly and now that there's now there's equity crowdfunding yeah. yeah so you can raise money through investors like crowdfunding yeah. but they actually own a piece of the movie mm-hmm. so that's a a whole new that's thing a, as well that's a whole other can of worms but i think that's it's very interesting i definitely we need to learn more about so it i, I, I want to ask you this and you know getting on, on back onto the mental health aspect of the yes. whole show <laughs> so tell me why you're so anti crowdfunding? <laughs> like, I, I mean, I know, like you said, you're afraid to, like, you know, toot your own horn and stuff like that. But is there anything specifically that's holding you back? <laughs> that's a or, great question. That's a I don't question. know. That's a and question. you've probably listen. You've probably not thought about something like that before. I'll frame it this way. Get, you know, get you thinking about mm-hmm. it a little bit. So I've spoken to a number of people that have told me their crowdfunding experiences. Mm-hmm. There's two camps. There's how I feel about it. And there's how just about everybody else I've ever spoken to feels about it. Okay. Most people are like you. They don't want to. And and I had gone into it originally when I was raising money for getting over. You don't want to feel like you're begging. You don't want to feel like, hey, just give me money to go make a movie. Because people that don't make movies for a living think movies can be frivolous, (laughs) you know, and don't really think of it as a career path. Specifically, like my wife, she's a real estate agent. She's a realtor. but She has a real job. She's got a real (laughs) job that really pays. But all of her... (laughs) All of her clients and the people that she works with, they're involved with real estate and money, and they don't really look at filmmaking as a job that you can have as a career. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and I've gotten that, I've, t- I've told this story on the show many times before. Paige and I have argued over this because I said to her, like, if I make another feature someday, which I will, when I make a feature someday, I'm going to need your help to raise money and that means going back to those people Mm -hmm. but those people because they're not in the entertainment world they look at it as well what you guys don't have money you what do you need my money for like are you guys okay like is the Mm -hmm. business we give you not enough for you to pay your house so my wife is a dear i love her dearly but she initially didn't want to like go back to that well Mm -hmm. because those people will be like what's going on but in the same vein it's like it's not that we're hard up for money Mm -hmm. it's just that i would i would rather have somebody else pay for it totally i love crowdfunding because it gives me that opportunity Mm -hmm. to involve people in the project to get some money i've donated to so many yeah exactly (laughs) so there should be no reason why we're against doing it I'm i'm not against it i'm just i guess i'm not thrilled to do it you don't want to have to yeah feel like you're begging i think it you know if the right project 
comes yeah. along and it's like, oh, you need an extra, you know, yeah. something to get it done. Or, you know, there's VFX and they, they, there, we went over budget. So we don't have right. a budget for VFX, but we got to do it. And we don't, um, yeah, they, I don't want it to. F- sound like I'm against crowdfunding. I think that's a great tool for filmmakers to use. And it I is think, a great tool. And I, I, you got your film funded? Absolutely. Yeah. And my I, movie wouldn't exist without yeah, crowdfunding. My cousin Jason uses I'm, it. I was just going to say, I'm actually directing on a series that is using crowdfunding to raise some of a portion of the money. So I have nothing against crowdfunding. I just personally have not used it and don't know when the next project that I would want to use it for is. All right. So there's no specific like mental hang up or, you know, something. I think you said it. It was kind of like, I don't want to beg for money. And it's maybe, again, just my own. There's just a block in sure. my head. Like or I said, you're in, not the only one that feels that and way. And the way I'm perceiving it. And I would rather have a personal connection, find a way to like fund things with a few, I mean, this is the dream, a few investors where I could have a personal connection with these people and have them invest in a project that I have versus having hundreds of people give me 50 50 bucks. But again, I have nothing against it. I just, I haven't used it. It just, there hasn't the the opportunity, the the right opportunity hasn't presented itself Yeah, maybe that's what it is. All right. So how have you guys been funding your projects then? Well, there was one project called Sweetheart, which uh, is still in the festival circuit right now, which we funded basically through our, through just ourselves. We did it through our production company. The we production saved projects. We, we saved, saved money. We saved money. So, all right, and so we, that's what we're getting at. So yeah. you, you took some of your person. Now you guys have, but you have a business that it all gets funneled through there. So it's all yes. it's like above deductible. Board and yeah, professional. yeah, exactly. But these are so you're getting paid to do your full time work taking some of your money, setting it aside to work on these projects exactly. for yourself. Yeah. All right, so that leads me into exactly. my next question. Sure. It's wonderful to be able to do that, but do you guys <laughs> worry that you're not going to be able to sustain that for a long time? Well, here's the thing. Or you're dipping into, you know, you guys are young We've too. Already, so. I feel like it's already <laughs> But like, you know, paid. dipping into savings and stuff. Like, I feel like it's already paid for itself yeah. in, a, okay. in a sense. The way, okay. at least the way I look at it, we've gotten, you know, other jobs ba- directly from the things that we've funded. Like, okay. you know, we, for, uh, it's for a it's, commercial for yourselves. That's what the project is. I mean, people up pay a hundred and, you know, 20 grand to go to film school or whatever and, and right. then go into debt. It's like, yeah, I'd much rather spend $10,000 on a short film, learn everything, everything from that and sure. like become okay. a better filmmaker and a better person like knowing how does it how does it actually happen how does it get done what does it take and luckily with us with Diliana as a producer you don't need to hire a producer to do all the sure. jobs that a producer would do with me as an editor and you know our friends as composers and uh, so you guys you know, haven't our been friends paying yourself grip. on your projects no no <laughs> oh, no, no, it's, it's just like we pay. We literally no. will will have friends who you know we love do us favors and eagerly say, "I want to DP this, sure, or I want to you know help. Put me on that. Whatever you need me to do, let me help." Um, and look, and these are people that we work with all the time. So let's right. say I have a commercial job. I will hire my DP who just worked you know as a favor on our other project for a commercial. So, you know production. what I mean? Like we, we have ways of sort of repaying indirectly for, you know, or you'll do something in kind. You'll produce somebody else's Absolutely. thing. If they help We're, out on yours. We've done so many projects. Find, yeah. Find your tribe mentality. Would I continue to spend like 10 or $20,000 of my own money on a project? No, probably not. Right. However, would I invest some of my own money on a project I really believed in that I think could take me or, you know, take us to the next level? Absolutely. I think the projects that we funded, it was also at a time where it was like, all right, we need to get reels for ourselves. We need to show people our work. Well, how are we going to do that? Let's just put our money where our mouth is and show people that we believe in ourselves and and have something to show for. Sure. So our first three or four shorts were sort of like, let's figure it out on our own and put it out there. And yeah. now we can go out and say, hey, we have ideas. And to be honest, that's all that it took because our last few projects have been paid for. We're getting hired to direct and produce things, narrative projects, just from the stuff that we've already, that we funded ourselves. So you you just basically, you, you invested in yourself and you and took it, a chance and you didn't really, you weren't really thinking at the time, holy shit, we're dipping into our savings. But you, you were like, we're investing in ourselves. This is a worthwhile expense. It's not a hobby. It's not frivolous. Mm-hmm. And you kind of dove into it from that perspective. Totally. Yeah. 
And, and it immediate, think, immediately know, paid off, I think. Great. I think if you go into it with fear, I think you're in a worse off place than if you just go into it thinking, okay, I could spend you know this money a, a thousand other ways. I could spend it on a quarter of a semester of film school. <laughs> and you know, right. and I don't have any problem with people who do that either. I think there's value in that. And you know, people will meet the people they meet in film school and that could take them to their the next place. But you know, we chose to do it where we invested in a project um, I don't regret it at this point. There's, you know, there's the other l other little projects that we've done that we spent a little like less money. It'd be like, you know, rent lenses and we'll rent lights, and it ends up being like what twelve hundred bucks and all in. But well, uh, it's not that big. No, yeah, no, 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 we're not. When we say we're investing in our projects, we're not talking about. I know you tens just finished a feature length like, right. documentary. We haven't it's funded like, our no, own like, feature. Here's, you know, uh, you know, $100,000. So it's I've been all been saving. shorts. So We're, talking We're talking about shorts. We're talking about, you know, two to three minute shorts or right. okay. 12 minute shorts, things that, you know, are very much doable. So within what, what we've invested in that, I feel like we've gotten enough of material. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So let me ask you this then. So you had said that these little pieces got you, have gotten you guys work as directors and producers. So tell me now a little bit about that experience where because i mean anybody can call themselves a director anybody can take the money out of their wallet and take camera in their phone and go shoot a movie totally. and call yourself a director and that's great i want everybody to be able to do that if you have a camera in your phone go make a movie yeah when did it start getting other people's attention that they wanted to start hiring you for work well i, I know the first thing that happened was the the virtual reality horror uh, series that we did which it was actually shooting the thing in the cabin. It's called The Sound. It's a, a short film that we shot up in Big Bear. This I, is one. This is one of our first self-funded projects. Before um, before Sweetheart, which yeah, was the bigger sh one. Short film called The Sound, and this was literally us, like a couple of friends, going to a cabin mm -hmm. with a camera. And uh, so there's this company called Amaze VR, and there's an acquaintance I had had met there. This guy named Simon, who is a producer and a kind of he is the VP of content for that this virtual reality company. He he's basically saw on my Instagram account hmm. that we I was posting like making a horror film in, in you know Big Bear and it's like me it's a picture of me looking at a monitor being laughing or something and he's like oh you know our he reached out to me via Instagram wow. and there's someone you already knew someone though. I had known and okay. you know we were acquaintances we kind of had a similar friend group. But he's like, hey, I'm working at this VR company and we're looking to do horrors. You should come in for a meeting. And I was like, oh, OK. But it literally just took that's when I was, kind of it clicked to me. I was like, just do it. Just, sure. you know, the if you do it, always if yes. you put yeah. it out there. Yeah, yeah like, never. Yeah, never say something nothing. will happen. And then right. that led to us having a pitch meeting and we pitched some ideas to them and they were really you know they liked some of the ideas and you know next thing we're doing an exorcism virtual reality horror series, horror series and it was really it was so much fun interactive it's yeah. great <laughs> paid to do something like that and that was like okay. so awesome so tell me about the experience of being paid by somebody else to work in something now so you, you when you're making your own stuff you don't have to answer to anybody yeah now there's somebody else calling the shots somebody else signing the checks are you worried about that? Do you feel like maybe you're in over your head? Like, t t tell me about that experience of oh, like man. the first time someone's like, That's "I want question. you to do this. I'm going to pay you." Tell me about that experience of, of coming to terms with that for the first time. Basically, all of a sudden, there's real deadlines. It's like get the script by this date. You know, have this done by that date. Have the final version. You know, and, and the deadlines start becoming overwhelming. And they're very real and they approach way quicker than they should. <laughs> right. Uh, Did but, you ever miss one where somebody yelled at you? No, like, no, you didn't no make thankfully this. we didn't miss any deadlines, but it was one of those things where we'd send something and just be terrified that they would hate the first <laughs> draft of it. You know, it was like that kind of stuff. How do you, so how do you, when you send something and you attach the file, you hit send and you now, look at the send button for 20 minutes first before hitting it, just staring <laughs> at the send button and then read the email three or four times. Re read make it sure again. Everything is make you, sure there's not too many exclamation points. You hit the button and then you find a couple of spelling mistakes <laughs> after that. Could, <laughs> I wish you could send an email or like pre send it so you can see what it's going to look like. Right. Send, Cause it always looks different. Give me a couple of seconds yeah. to and be like, are you sure more? this is what you want? So tell, yeah so tell me about that experience of like now you're dealing with people like people are giving you notes on something that you made. it's like everything that you had ever done for other people but now it's like your own stuff like what what are you worrying about what are you thinking about when all of this is starting to happen well with vr it, it was kind of interesting because we had never shot anything in virtual reality and so you're also scared as shit that you're gonna screw everything yeah up. like you you were trying to figure out how does this how does it even work you know it's kind of like theater it's kind of like a video game this thing was interactive so we had to create like 
multiple versions, outcomes, multiple outcomes. Oh, well. things uh, of the story. Yeah. So there was the fear and just not knowing if this was going to be good or not right. knowing how this would all look because you know you don't shoot as coverage because it's just what pushes you when you're worrying about that when you're when you just don't know the outcome of what you're shooting and you're not sure like what's going through your mind like how do you deal with that I think oh, it's man. for me it's the opportunity the new opportunity to be right there on the edge of something new and the excitement of that just kind of pushes you through it's weird it's uh, I feel like that feeling of anxiety that you get when you're <laughs> working on something it's horrible and amazing at the same time like I, like I love the feel I, I love it and I hate it I don't know why I keep putting myself in these situations you're an where addict like, oh I, I don't I just want this to be over and that's also something I've heard other people talk about like you know being on the edge yeah and not necessarily knowing how it's going to turn out pushes you to like I want to figure out what this is going <laughs> to that's turn it. out to be I think we both had our spent a lot of time in comfort zones like in our own comfort zones working our editing jobs or producing jobs and it's like you get used to doing it and it's easy you clock in you clock out there is something invigorating about being in this position where you know you're scared and you don't know how it's going to be but at least you're there it makes me want to do it more and bigger and like i want to get to the next step so there's never been a point in time where like the pressure felt like oh this is too much i don't want to do there's this. always there's like a break i feel like there's moments always where with, it's just like, i think i think with every single project we've had a moment of a major breakdown yeah it's just an, where an one of us Probably not both at the same time, but one of us just loses their shit. And it's like... That's what's good about having two people. You, one person loses their shit and then the other person's like, it's going to be all right. We'll right, get through it. Always that, Don't that worry. calming ele element. Doing it on your own, I like, is, it must be so much harder. Doing it on your, yeah, there is a freedom to doing it on your own and not yeah. having to answer to anybody. Yeah. But sometimes there's nobody to answer to but yourself. Yeah. I had a friend that posted a tweet this morning too that she said like, one of my biggest pet peeves are people that miss deadlines or something like that and i was like well when you work for yourself there, mm. really, there are no real deadlines That's i give true. myself deadlines all the time but no one's going to hold me accountable if yeah you know like oh my show needs to go out on tuesday oh if it goes out on wednesday who's, fine. who's gonna stop me yeah. which right. is great to have that freedom but sometimes you also need that structure as well mm -hmm. yeah so you guys provide that for each other when when things kind of go a little bit askew you guys are there to be able to pick each other up and She's the schedule. stay on track definitely i mean my, my producing days are paying off but i, I yeah, definitely the calendars are all marked and you bring your producer knowledge into your marriage oh <laughs> yeah it's a little bit much sometimes but yeah no i i like being on schedule and i'm definitely the one I who's just don't. like okay we have to send this email and you know we need to schedule this brainstorm session right now and yeah right. i definitely have that's what gives me control in my life of freelance is scheduling my life. <laughs> sure. I mean, that's what that's what producing really is. Like you're producing your life when you have to I'm, pay your bills every month. You're pro got to produce myself. You know? yeah. <laughs> that's another thing I love about production is like it's hyper scheduled times. Like every minute is scheduled during production. And then when you're done, it's done. And now you can live the freedom is that much sweeter right, right. <laughs> so let's so let's bring it bring it all back around a little bit so yeah. when you had said when you came out here and you were into editing and into writing music and all of that mm -hmm. and now you're directing things yes so how have your career goals changed since you first moved out here do you feel like you're still on the path and for you as well Diliana? like do you guys feel like you're still on the career path that you always envisioned for yourself did mm -hmm. things change for you along oh, yeah. the way and you want to do something else do you feel like you're doing the right thing for what you originally set out to do when you moved to la that's a very good question and listen, it might not, you might not have an answer to it. It might not be something you think about all I the time. I do think about it all the time. Do you? That's the thing is, you know, what do I want to be doing? And am I doing everything I need to be doing? I'm con that's, that's the question I'm battling all, at all times. Like, I want to direct my own projects. You know, is directing a, a true crime series, it's close. It's like skirting it. Right. It's sharpening tools right. for that. And I think that is going to pay off. I just have to trust those tools will be used later on and it will pay off. And it as is long something as I, you think about. It is something I think about all the time. I want to be either making, if not my own content, something uh, something really great. I just want to be working on a project that is meaningful, a project that pushes the needle, a project that like I can get really passionate behind. And not that I, I try to get really passionate behind all the projects I work on, but it's like, I want to just be on that 
well, something that I'm really excited about. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this. It's just you're always wanting the next thing, sure. right? So I, I think for both of us, we're both really ambitious and we, we have dreams of doing just more, bigger projects, more. We want to collaborate with you know, everyone we admire out there. And it's just, I, I think it's just a little bit of, is it happening? Am I doing it? You know, exactly what you yeah. said. Am I doing every single thing that I should be to do like, it? Right. And there's no it's just, book, there's no checklist, there's no, no website that says you so, need to do this, 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 and this, and then everything's going to be right. right. It's like, so, you know, it, and you never know what the next opportunity is going to be. It's like, oh, is, there's a job editing on Westworld that opens up. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm into that. Or it's an assistant editor. Like, even if it's just getting into the right thing that I feel like... I don't know where that path will be. Sure, you're not closing the door to I'm anything. I'm not closing right the door now. to anything at this point. But at the same time I'm pushing my own ideas, I'm working on my own scripts. I'm, you know, I've got some pitch meetings coming up that I'm excited about. Great. And, uh, I think we're just trying to choose our next projects with that in mind. Is is this project cuz we've gotten to a point now where Again, we have a, net, a, a pretty good network of people. We we get called for jobs. We have you know people who want to collaborate with us, and it's just choosing the jobs that we do and what we focus our attention to, and just asking that question every time: is is this taking me? Is this project and my commitment to this project taking me in the right direction for what I want to continue be, to be doing? Right. Am I learning something new, or is it exactly what I want the trajectory that I want to go in? Right. Or is this, or am I taking this job because? it's safe and I need the money or just kind of knowing what the reason behind what we're right. doing. And now more than ever, I'm choosier on projects that I take. Like I, I'm just thinking about that all the time. Time is going faster. There's as I'm, you know, yeah. older, I, there doesn't seem to be as much time to just <laughs> do everything. So it's now that's the fear is which is the right step to take. Luckily, I'm not worried about where the financial thing, where the money will come because, you know, there's enough jobs. I've been here long enough doing it that I Great. think I'm comfortable there. It's just figuring out the right step to take where I, I have an opportunity to work in something that I really want to do. And that's why I, I'm, we're continuing to write our own projects. Which is well a luxury, as, let's face it's it. A, it's a huge luxury. And it's, I'm very grateful to be in that Well, what that do position. you guys find that you worry about the most now like just in general about life like what do you do you worry about choosing that next project like do you like like what are the things that keep you guys up it's, at night i guess it's like taking a financial pro a project that's going to make us a lot of money versus a project that's going to bring us happiness it's like figuring out do i turn this down for this or do i stop doing all this together and spend time trying to get onto a bigger project or a project that i think is closer to the direction I want to be. It's just trying to figure out how to where to steer the so ship. So you guys feel point. like you've gotten to a place where like the things that worry you the most are really about crafting your career, just like just like crafting a film. Yes, crafting mm -hmm. your career to go in the direction that you wanted to go in. You don't have to worry anymore about making your rent. You think yeah. things are stable enough that that's not what's driving you. You just Luckily, want to be able to do the right point. things for what you guys are at this point. Yeah, taking, that, listen, it, I mean, can, it's taken change. 10 years to get to that. Point. Sure. Of course. Like it's not been, you know, it also things change again, you know, like every, every year is different and you know, you just have to sort of like adjust with, with it. Sure. But I, I do think that we have for the past couple of years, just really been focusing on what do we want to really do? What do we want to make and how do we do it and how do we get there? And sure. those have been the most pressing things for us. Have you guys done any talk about family planning yet and how that's going to impact your career? Cause that's going to require <laughs> taking a, uh, taking a break. Yeah. Exactly. Or well, we're trying to make it all happen together. And that's, that's a lot. Uh, Knowing us, we'll try to make it all happen together. <laughs> I know. Yeah, there's been talk. There's been talk about that. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I wasn't there for that. My talk. problem is, I, I probably don't worry enough about things. I just kind of dive into them and then figure out from there. Sure. Like, we both have that actually, which I think we're just kind of like, let's well, see what happens. I do. I am worried about you know being able to have an opportunity to work on something that I can be truly proud of. I sure. think, or something that affects people like brings people a feeling that i want like when i see a great movie or and i see a, something that i just that impacts me a certain way i'm just like that is amazing and i want to be able to do that great my biggest fear at this point my biggest worry is that i make a wrong choice that stops me from getting there you know the feeling of having a great documentary when all when people are 
you know, reaching out to you and saying like this documentary like impacted, I, impacted the way I, I live. Like that's that's amazing. That's a that's great. I'd love to figure out a way to streamline it so I can work on a bunch of projects that have a potential to do that. Sure. You I'm know. sure that'll happen. All right, let me ask you again, two last quick questions and then we'll we'll wrap up. So what do you guys you you guys had mentioned on multiple occasions some on one of your projects somebody melts down. Yeah, there's oh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's tensions, meltdowns. Tensions run high. <laughs> no. What do you guys do to de-stress? What do you guys do to leave that stuff behind? What do you guys do? I mean, the entertainment the industry wall. is, yeah, it, sometimes you feel yeah. like you want to punch the wall. What do you guys do to just flee get Los away Angeles and reset? No. I mean, uh, we, we hike a lot. I think we, we have a way of kind of, I mean, and that's the easy answer, but I think sometimes when we're, you know, like cool. working out, like, yeah, going out into nature, like just yeah. getting away is kind of a thing. And what's great about L Los Angeles is there's so many places to just yep. feel like you're away from sure. everything. Recenter yourself. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the only way is just like removing yourself from what's happening. If it, depending on where the stresses are coming also, from. Also sure. music for me, like I have a piano in the other room. I'll play it whenever I'm kind of wound up. I'll play I, much to my neighbors probably hate me for, <laughs> for it. I'll just play and it will, it's very cathartic and it just kind of helps. Does his playing out. calm you down? Because you can't get away from it. Yeah, I know. I mean, I don't oh, know. I hope, I, I hope I, she doesn't hate it. I don't hate it, obviously. I mean, right. I married it, so I wouldn't hate it. She's but. never complained. Well, no. No, I, what, no what? she's never complained about <laughs> when it. When did I complain? I'm always, like, sometimes I'll worry that, like, what I'm playing, I'm like, oh, she, this, I'm, I'm no. embarrassed to play something. He's a beautiful pianist. <laughs> I have no complaints at all. But, yeah. you know, I, I'm not going to say, like, oh, be, when he plays, that that relaxation right. just transfers over to me. <laughs> I think I think we both have our own ways of yeah. of, of, just, of yeah, dealing with it. You know, de-stressing. yourself. Yeah. How do you de-stress? I still am figuring that out <laughs> because I have a very hard time. Uh, I take things very personal. I don't know. I can't think of anything in particular right now, but I, I, I get stressed out over, uh, you know, I'm a neurotic New York Jew. Like, and like my battery, battery died, died in the garage. Like now I'm all, my day yeah, is yeah, all yeah. a mess, <laughs> yeah. you know? So I, it's a number of things. I collect baseball cards. I like you. I can't play the piano, but I will listen to music, listen, watch listen. TV, watch comedy, you know, watch a movie, Try to work on stuff, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, it's yeah, just a lot of baseball cards and watching movies mm -hmm. at this point. So yeah, and I'm still figuring it out too because I'd like to be less stressed. And like I said, that goes back to what I was saying about when I had a full time job. I always knew waking up the next day that that job was there, and maybe I should have left it years earlier. But having that stability brought me a, a, a sense of calm that now. You know, even though we are also very lucky, we can pay our mortgage, we, we are comfortable, but I am not working a full-time job anymore. And that can be, you know, I'm around the house more often. So my wife is like, you need to leave the house more. I'm like, I can't edit from anywhere. <laughs> you know, some people can, I don't have a system that can do that. Um, you know, so in terms of like de-stressing and stuff like that, I can do a better job of it. But what I like to do is to talk to guys like you and hear how other people do that and then i incorporate all this stuff so these are like when i do these interviews with people like i want to kind of frame them like therapy sessions so mm -hmm. people can feel comfortable sharing that stuff uh -huh. but they're really self-therapy sessions for me yeah because i worry about things too much i worry about where the next job is going to come from i worry about how people view me as an artist do people view me as an artist at all do people like my movie do people hate my movie did you hate my movie why do you hate my movie and those are just the things that rattle around in my mind all the time so i found that one of the things that really brings me a sense of calm is is hearing how other people deal with it, yeah. you know, and how p other people have dealt with their uh, Los Angeles experience and their experiences trying to make a career in the entertainment industry. Yeah. So that's really why I kind of started the show is because yeah, I like to talk to people I mean, about how they great. make it I happen. Definitely, it does feel like I definitely think that everybody to some degree, I'm sure goes through that. I mean, we're all sure. putting ourselves out there when you do anything creative, it's very vulnerable. Right. And you know that when you put it out there, you just, you're open to any sort of comments. Right. Especially and I want online. people to realize, yeah, and I want people to realize that, you know, somebody just getting started in this business and they worry about those sorts of things, we all have to deal with it. And it's very difficult. I, I've spoken to a bunch of other people on the show too about jealousy and my jealousy and like being jealous. And that's why I wanted to ask you guys about how firm you were in your career goals because for me like i'm not a director 
I've never been a director. This is I've directed shorts and I've directed this feature, but I never moved out here to become a director. You're still a director, but you're, you're a you're director. Di- you yes, are. but I, well, I had gotten and I, after the movie did well, and after we got into South by Southwest, I was like, well, maybe I do want to be a director. And I spoke to George, who owns Framework, and he was like, you should get an agent and you should go for. And I see the stuff that Framework does and the promo. I'm like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do it. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of wanting to do the show is over the last couple of years, it's almost two years now, of a lot of soul searching and real you know, trying to figure out what I really want from a career in this business. Cause I've done it for a really long time. I've done the full time work, I've done the freelance work, I've done the film festival circuit, I've done all of that. And still to this day, don't quite know what the next step is. I know what I want to do next. But I don't know if I can get someone to give me $300,000 to make Mm. another movie. So, like, I know that that opportunity might not present itself again. So, I have to find a way to build this, like, next part of my career into something that I want to do. Let me talk to people. Mm-hmm. I like talking to I like talking to other filmmakers more than and I don't mean like businessy like mm-hmm. stuff like I just love talking to filmmakers. Yeah. I love hearing everybody's perspective and everybody's experience. This is this is what it all boils down to is everyone's going to have a different perspective, everyone's going to have a different experience, but there is something that binds us as filmmakers, that vulnerability. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like you know this is why I like talking to people about anxiety and fear because we all feel it and everyone's right now it's so hot like find your tribe or just push through it mm-hmm. you just have to make it happen well for some people me especially there's a disconnect between how you feel where you want to be and just pushing through it mm-hmm. the just pushing through it part is what the heart of what this show is about mm-hmm. yeah because it's so easy to say, just push through it. Just do it. Just do the crowdfunding. Just, mm-hmm. just, just, just go out there. Just put it out I got, there. I, I gotta, I gotta push through that crowdfunding you know, myself. I just so. need to push through it. But some people wake up in the morning, and I had a, I had a ton of trouble doing this after the movie premiered. I would wake up in the morning and like just push through it. How do you just push through it when you don't want to? Sometimes. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. it's. I think that's very real for a lot of people and I think to different degrees and I think we are lucky that again going back to having each other because I think I wake up and it's we got to get this done so I'm going to push through because I'm being counted you know I'm being we hold each other accountable accountability so I think for me like that's just one aspect of it that helps me with the just push through like we're in this together we have to we have to do it right, right. there's no questions um there's no other option right and but my wife is not a filmmaker which, so like, which makes it a little bit give it, it's a little bit of a lonelier experience it's a, it is a lonelier experience you know sometimes the non filmmaker uh, input two films is like the most valuable you can get too. like if you know what i mean like i'm sure you're showing her your cuts of things and she has it input surprisingly like, no she doesn't want to see cuts no. sometimes Perfect. No. she doesn't want to <laughs> like you know I'll, the movie that i'm editing right now i'll be like do you want to see what we're working on and i mean either she's got work to do it's not that she doesn't want to see it you know she's she goes to hollywood movies she wants to go yeah, see yeah. you know love actually so yeah. when i'm like look at my little 12 you know nine minute short film that doesn't star anybody you know Nah, it's all right you're doing good you know so i mean that's different for different people it's true and that's well, all but i think ultimately what does connect us all is the fact that we're filmmakers right what you just right. said is that we have decided that that is our long-term goal that's our life it's a lifestyle you decide that you want to do that and regardless of what the next move is or what your next title is going to be or if you decide to call yourself a net director or an editor or whatever that may be it's that you're a filmmaker. And that I think that that's what keeps me going is because sometimes I'll think about, it's hard, but I'll think about what else could you be doing right now? What else would be better than this? And so when I start going down that list, there isn't one. There's nothing else that I would rather be doing or could really fall back on or really right now my mind can come up with. So So that's what pushes you to push through. So then the next thing is just like, I accept that I will continue to do this work for the rest of my life or until I decide I don't want to anymore, (laughs) right? right? So I think like that's what keeps me going and that's what keeps me sort of sane and the, the world of everyone's career is different, everyone's perspective is different and 
as long as you commit to knowing that this is what you're going to do, you'll figure it out on in right. your own way. That's great. That's great. And are you guys happy with where you're at right now? Oh yeah. Uh, you're happy with I know life? you asked this question. We kind of like dodged it before, but yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy. I think, you know, I feel very fortunate and I feel that, uh, I'm, I'm happy with where we are. I just, I, I just want more. I just want the next sure. thing. I mean, I, yeah, the, yeah, just because you're not necessarily where you think you're going to be, some like doesn't mean you're not happy. You got to learn how to appreciate what. Yeah, what you, have you have to learn to appreciate what you have. Yeah. And be grateful for you know the things that you do have. Because I also think that goes back to what you were saying when we were talking about like your origin story. You couldn't quite remember some of the earlier stuff. Like yeah. it, it doesn't resonate with you because that's not you know you weren't at that place. But you, you would say you're happy with where you're at in life right now oh, in, yeah. in general? Oh, absolutely. I think I'm very happy. I think I, I live my life the way that I envision living my life. I create my own schedule. I wake up every day and I work on things that I want to work on. And I accept projects that I want to accept. And I hang out with creative people. And I couldn't imagine it being any other way. Um, That's I'm, great. I'm very, very happy. And 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 I am learning more and more to just sort of happy like happy but not content. Not not content. Okay, that's a great way to put it. That's a great yeah. way to put it. Yeah, because you don't it, want to rest on those laurels. Well, because it's always moving, right? Like every day is different. Every week, you know, and especially with my with with my jobs, right. with my paid work, sometimes they they come in and it's like in three days, can you start? So it's just always changing. Everything is always moving. Yeah. And I, but I am very very happy, and I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'm learning to sort of, like you said, have gratitude and and experience the now and the projects that I have now, instead of just like constantly wanting to be on the next thing. It's sort of just like figure out well, what did we learn from that, and sure. what is this experience, and just sort of be in the now because I feel like in a few years I'm sure we'll be working on bigger projects absolutely. where there's more at stake and absolutely um, the nerves are maybe probably a bigger thing because we'll the stakes will be higher yeah, exactly. and so I just try to remind myself sometimes of like we're having fun right now and and we're doing the things we're doing and you know let's just be happy about it because that's great that's all we can be that's great. <laughs> so tell me again what do you guys have right now and what's coming up and what's you know where can we find your stuff where can we find you Okay, so I just finished a series called Deadly Recall, and it's season two of this series called Deadly Recall for ID Network, uh, Investigation Discovery Network. Great. It's a true crime murder show. Awesome. <laughs> where it's about this detective who has a photographic memory, and he has solved over 125 or 20, 30 murder cases. And uh, yeah, he goes and kind of explains his process for how he solved the cases and they're it's pretty pretty and cool. you're directing cool. this right now yes just finished we wrapped the show on friday and then i'm actually going starting tomorrow i'm going to edit the remaining episodes there's there's been five editors on the show already and they've locked a couple episodes but they just uh, and when's it gonna you know, when's it gonna air april 15th i think okay the day? april mid-april okay we'll, we'll put all of that in the show notes this will probably air after that date so deadly recall I, season two Deadly it's Recall. Be great. Keep an eye out for Deadly <laughs> Recall season two. We'll have in the show notes all information on how to find it and how to watch it and all of that. Mm -hmm. Deliana, what are you working on right now? Well, I we have a short film, Sweetheart, that's in festivals right now or right. W whatever festivals haven't canceled. Um, and then oh, yeah. we have a short film, a horror short film called The Sound that we just put released online because that's done with festivals. And um, so you can find all of these out on YouTube and Vimeo. Yeah, we'll put all the links um, for all these yep. movies and stuff in the show notes so everybody can go and watch your stuff. And, and it's great. next month, I am directing two episodes of a, of a series called Marriage of Inconvenience. And it's a comedy series. It's great. Um, so that will be airing on Deku. I don't know when. It's a... It's a platform that's like a streaming platform. Like a streaming platform. Okay. Yeah. So we'll put that. We'll out try to have well. all that info. <laughs> we'll have all that info in there. Where can we got find you guys online? Like, do you have social media presence? Oh yeah. We're, oh we're yeah. All, we're all over there. <laughs> we have a our actually our, our company yeah, company website. Our or company has a company Instagram, which is Great. Gravina Films Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's where where I, I try to post about uh, projects that Deliana we finished. Does most of the posting. Um. Great. So it's like some behind the scenes stuff and some some outtakes and some you know screenshots from and the that's projects. Gravina Films on Instagram. Yeah. All right, we'll have that link in there for you guys as well. Cool. Diliana Gravina, <laughs> Jack Gravina, pleasure talking with you guys. Thank Thanks you so, so much, much for letting me into your house, into your home for, for this episode. And it's been a uh, pleasure. best of luck as uh, your careers continue its upward trend. And I look forward to seeing your stuff on streaming platforms, TV, and uh, wherever else we can find you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jason. We Thanks, love Jason. you. Thanks for Thank having you us so as much. guests. All right. We'll see you guys soon. Take care. Bye. All right, bye.